Welcome back to our series of four short films for anybody who's been asked to play the organ or the piano for a church service. Once again, we're focusing on the straightforward things which you can do to make the most of your existing technique and to make the experience more enjoyable, less nerve-wracking and more effective. Today we're looking at a topic specifically for organists, so that's the choice of stops. So if you play the piano in a service, then you can safely jump over this episode and go straight on to episode three. So the choice of stops doesn't need to be a complicated matter. In fact, it's better if it isn't. It's way better to focus on rhythmic playing than on doing really fancy things with stops. But I'd like to focus today on four myths, if you like, or four misunderstandings about the stops themselves. The first one is that you add stops only to gain extra volume of sound. The second misunderstanding is that a large congregation necessarily needs a loud volume of sound and a small congregation needs a quiet volume of sound. The third one is that you need to change stops radically between each verse of a hymn. And the fourth one is that you should always play the introduction more quietly than the verse. So those are the four things which we'll really focus on today. So let's look at a few general principles. And the first one which I'd like to look at is that the most significant factor in all this is not volume, but brightness. And I'll show you why. To find out exactly why, I think we need to take a brief tour into the theory of musical sound but I'll promise to keep that very uh, straightforward. Musical sound is made up of a variety of different pitches and we can demonstrate that really simply on a piano. If you hold down a note silently, like so, and then strike the note an octave below, let go of it, you can now hear really clearly the note which you didn't sound, the note which you've just pressed down. That's because you, in pressing it down, took the dampers off it and the string resonated in sympathy with that part of the pitch of a note an octave lower that was sounding. You can do it at two octaves as well, slightly more weakly, just hear that top C going there, or an octave and a half, for example, that's a G, an octave and a half up from the C. You can hear it there. It doesn't work with adjacent notes, for example, so if I pressed a D and then pressed the C, you don't get anything. That's because each note contains certain harmonics at an octave and an octave and a half, and to a lesser extent other fractions as well, all within the compound of its sound structure. So the technical term for those sounds which are one or two octaves higher, or to some extent fractions of an octave higher, is harmonics, or sometimes partials especially when we're talking about strange fractions of an octave. The relative strength of these various harmonics and partials is what gives different instruments their identity, their character of sound, and of course organ stops as well. Organ sound is relatively dull, that is to say it has rather weak upper harmonics or partials. And that's why we have a range of stops at different pitches, the four foot and the two foot, as well as the mutation stops and mixtures and so on, because they allow us to adjust that proportion and to emphasize the upper harmonics. 
Some organs have reed stops as well, a trumpet or what have you, and they also are very rich in partials, and therefore they too can give um, an extra impetus to the sound structure. So those high up harmonics are particularly useful because you can hear them most clearly even while you're singing because they are at a higher pitch than the pitch you're singing at. It's the same effect as hearing a piccolo above a full orchestra. You hear it there because it's above the other instruments. So let's look at what that means for different kinds of congregations. Here is a church with a small congregation, and here's a church with a large congregation. Now, all congregations want plenty of support, but there is a difference between the two. So those high up harmonics, the ones you can hear most clearly above the singing, they are more fragile than the lower ones, which means that they can get easily absorbed into bodies and clothing and therefore get lost. So when there are a lot of people in the church, the sound of the organ becomes duller and therefore harder to hear above the singing. So in this picture, the organ sound is depicted as colours from the blues, which represent the low pitches, up to the reds and yellows, which represent the high pitches. And those higher pitches, the brighter colours, are getting lost. So to combat that, we need to add more of those higher stops. So we can add an, a four foot principle or a two foot something or other, because that's going to give us that brighter sound that's going to be heard. And as I say, some organs have a reed stop, a trumpet or what have you, uh, with lots of upper harmonics. So they too can be heard very dominantly. But on the other hand, if you've got a little congregation, those high up harmonics are not going to get absorbed by lots of bodies, which means that they're still going to be uncomfortably obtrusive and people will complain that you're drowning them out. But the people in your little congregation feel rather vulnerable because they're so few. I think last week we invited us to pretend that we were sitting in the congregation and asked what do we actually need. So imagine now that you're sitting in that tiny congregation, half a dozen other people, and you're going to sing. What is it you're feeling? Well, if you're anything like me, you're feeling rather vulnerable. You're feeling you really don't want to be singing a solo. You don't want to stand out. And so you're going to moderate what you do rather. And you need that feeling of confidence and support. So these people in your little congregation feel vulnerable because they're so few. And they need your help to feel that they're not alone. So they still need to feel that the organ is actually surrounding them and supporting them at the pitch that they're singing at. And in fact, that need is more than that of a big congregation. So the difference between a large congregation and a small congregation in terms of the sound that they're needing is not so much in volume, but is in brightness. Your little congregation still needs plenty of eight-foot sound, so an eight-foot principle, an eight-foot flute, and so on, but not the four-foot and two-foot stops, which are intended to replace the sounds which are getting lost and absorbed in lots of bodies. So that actually is our first two points dealt with. Uh, for our third point, I think I'll take the question of playing the playover, and should it be quieter than the verse? Well, last time, again, we talked about a conductor bringing in a choir. Now, let's say that you're sitting in this choir and the choir is about to sing the Hallelujah Chorus. And so the conductor beats you in. What signal does that give you? Well. I think that it gives you the signal that actually we want to sing very quietly. And that really is going to confuse the choir because the Hallelujah Chorus starts rather loudly. 
And in just the same way, when you are playing your playover, you need to signalize not only the rhythm, but also the feeling, the volume, the enthusiasm with which people are to join in. And so, while it's fine to change a stop or even to, to use two different manuals to get a little bit of contrast, you really don't want to be playing significantly more quietly or less brightly in the playover than in the verse itself, because the playover is actually giving signals about how people are to sing. So my final myth of the day is that each verse needs a completely different set of stops. You need huge contrasts in registration. People don't notice it very much. And there are certainly more important things to be focusing on. I'm sure that you've had the same experience that I have, which is that when you're planning a service, you're planning perhaps the hymn in peace and calm and tranquility in an empty church. You have all the time in the world. You can plan all kinds of fancy registrations. But then in a service itself, you've got a million other things to think about. You've got a higher level of tension. You're perhaps a little bit nervous. You can't do half as much. So it's always better to underestimate the amount of things that you'll be able to do. It's a good rule of thumb that any changes of stops which you're planning between verses should always be possible to do with just one movement, either pushing things in or pulling things out on just one side of the organ. So to plan to push in a stop on one side of the organ and pull out a stop on the other side is really courting disaster unless you are 100% certain of your ability to do it. But remember that an organ sounds different in a full church from in an empty church. As I say, the thing which gets lost in a full church is the brightness. And so you are going to get a long way by adding brighter stops or taking away brighter stops if you want to have a verse which is more subdued. So just adding or subtracting a two foot or a mixture or what have you, that is going to make more difference than anything else. It's certainly going to make a lot more difference than changing between two eight foot stops. Nobody will notice that because they're singing at that pitch anyway. But there are other ways of making contrasts as well. Here's four verses of a hymn. To save time, I'll just play the first and the last line of each verse. And think about the different registrations which I'm using for the four verses. How many registrations did I use there? The answer is they were all the same registration. 
if I pretended to change stops, it was mere pretense. What I did was the first verse I played normally, the second verse I played with the melody an octave higher, the third verse I played without pedals, and the fourth verse I played with pedals and thickened the harmonies up a little bit. So you got a slightly different texture with each verse, and that gives the impression of changing stops, even though actually it didn't. But a really good idea to work out in advance a system for the stop changes which we're going to make. So have it all planned. One small point there is that when we're talking about stop changes in organ music in general, we suggest that it's a good idea not to have two four-foot stops at the same time on the same manual, so a four-foot principal and a four-foot flute, for example, because they don't add anything and the two stops are likely to be very slightly out of tune with each other, so it will just muddy the sound. But when we're talking about registration for hymns, those rules go completely out of the window and it's much better then to keep the stop changes as simple as possible, even if that means breaking these rules which we normally set that we don't have multiple four-foot or two-foot stops out at the same time. Again, when it's accompanying a congregation, these things are less noticeable and they're certainly less important. And of course, if during a service we are uncertain whether we're going to be able to actually carry out the stop change that we've planned, in the time available, then abandon it. It's much less important to change the stops than to keep that rhythm going. So have it as a priority in our own mind that the stop changes are the first thing to go. Don't do it if we're not sure that it's going to work. And one thing which I find helpful if I'm going to change a stop, push one in or pull one out, is as I'm playing the last note of the verse, I'm actually looking at the stop knob itself that I'm going to change. And that way I know that I can get my hands straight to it. It's, that's better than fumbling for it in the interval between the verses. So again, it's a case of just having things slightly ahead of time, just planning and being sure that we can do what we're setting out to do. Well, that was stops. And I think the main message to take away is keep it simple. Next week, we're going to go back to the question of uh, the hymn itself, and we're going to be looking at the verses. So I hope you'll uh, join me there.